Here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report, I'm Amy Goodman. President Trump is having his first official meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin today at the G20 summit in Hamburg, Germany. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov are the only ones who will be in the room with them. This comes as thousands of people have filled the streets around the G20 summit to demonstrate against globalization, as well as Donald Trump's policies. Well, National Security Advisor General H.R. McMaster said last week there's no specific agenda for the meeting. The topics of conversation uh, could include the war in Syria, North Korea, U.S. economic sanctions against Russia and nuclear weapons. Democrats are also pushing for Trump to confront Putin directly about the alleged Russian interference in the 2000s. 2016 election. On Thursday, five Senate Democrats, including minority leader Chuck Schumer of New York, sent a letter to Trump calling on him to, quote, make absolutely clear that Russian interference in our democracy will in no way be tolerated, unquote. But during a news conference Thursday from Poland, Trump cast doubt on whether he believes Russia interfered in the 2016 election. Will you once and for all, yes or no, definitively say that Russia interfered in the 2016 election? Well, I think it was Russia, and I think it could have been other people in other countries. Uh, could have been a lot of people interfered. I've to... said it very, I said it very simply. I think it could very well have been Russia, but I think it could well have been other countries, and I won't be specific. But uh, I think a lot of people interfere. I think it's been happening for a long time. It's been happening for many, many years now. The thing I have to mention is that Barack Obama, when he was president, found out about this in terms of if it were Russia, uh, found out about it in August. Now, the election was in November. That's a lot of time. He did nothing about it. So the follow-ups for you on that, Mr. President, you again say you think it was Russia. Your intelligence agencies have been far more definitive. They say it was Russia. Why won't you agree with them well, and say it I'll was? Well, I'll tell you, let me just start off by saying, I heard it was 17 agencies. I said, boy, that's a lot. Do we even have that many? intelligence agencies, right? Let's check it. And we did some very heavy research. It turned out to be three or four. It wasn't 17. And many of your compatriots had to change their reporting, and they had to apologize, and they had to correct. Now, with that being said, mistakes have been made. I agree. I think it was Russia, but I think it was probably other people and or countries. And I see nothing wrong with that statement. Uh, nobody really knows. That was President Trump being questioned by NBC White House correspondent Haley Jackson. But Trump took a more adversarial position against Russia, speaking later in the day in Warsaw's Krasinski Square, in a speech in which he also claimed the future of Western civilization was at risk. We urge Russia to cease its destabilizing activities in Ukraine and elsewhere, and its support for hostile regimes, including Syria and Iran, and to instead join the community of responsible nations in our fight against common enemies and in defense of civilization itself. The fundamental question of our time is whether the West has the will to survive. Do we have the confidence in our values to defend them at any cost? Do we have enough respect for our citizens to protect our borders? For more, we're joined by Katrina Vanden Heuvel, editor and publisher of The Nation magazine, America's oldest weekly magazine. Katrina Vanden Heuvel is also columnist for TheWashingtonPost.com. Her latest article there headlined Patriotism in the Trump Era. So, they are meeting today. It's Trump and uh, Putin, mm -hmm. it's Lavrov okay. and Tillerson. Even that is an enormous deal, um, clearly keeping this circle very close. How do we even know what they will have talked about? Who's going to say? Well, and do you believe those who say it? Well, I think one has to step back, Amy, and just <clears throat> set the scene. I mean, we are facing the greatest nuclear catastrophe since the first Cold War. And I think urgent, practical steps need to be taken to reduce the risks of military nuclear confrontation and to stop the cycle downward of distrust. I, I think you can despise Putin, you can despise Trump, but it's simply sober realism to acknowledge that there are serious uh, there's serious interest in a working relationship with Russia to resolve the crisis in Syria, 
which is destabilizing those European leaders sitting in Hamburg through the humanitarian crisis of refugee flows, to halt the nuclear escalation, to deal with nuclear nonproliferation, uh, to deal with cyber issues. By the way, I mean, we focus a lot on cyber issues in this country, and foreign interference in elections is unacceptable. There must be an independent, fair investigation. But there are reports out this morning, I think, of possible cyber hacks of uh, nuclear utilities. I think cyber hacks, as Senator Nunn said in a very important open letter people should read, Sam Nunn, the former senator from Georgia, released a letter June 27th, the danger of cyber hacks of strategic arsenals or command and control systems is something we need to face, pay attention to. The fact that this is a small circle, it's happened before, more hopefully in 1986, when uh, Soviet leader Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan met in Reykjavik, and uh, Reagan's aides had to pull him out of a meeting where he and Gorbachev were going to abolish nuclear weapons, something the U.N. treaty, which is underway, I think, or signed today, is a good step toward reducing nuclear arsenals. But I think it's an important meeting, and I step back again and say, as thousands of Americans who signed a petition by Roots Action over July 4th weekend, negotiate, don't escalate. And it is neither pro, you know, it's, it's not. I mean, Trump sounds like f warmed over fourth rate Reagan in Poland. So it's not in support of that. It's stepping back and saying both countries have real interests in trying to work together. I want to turn to Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, speaking Wednesday ahead of uh, their meeting with the president of Russia and the foreign minister. I think the, the important uh, aspect of this is that. Uh, this is where we've begun uh, an effort to begin to rebuild confidence between ourselves and Russia uh, at the military to military level, but also at the diplomatic level. So I think uh, it is an effort that serves both of our interests as well as the broader interests of the international community. Uh, we hope that this is going to be the beginning of other important areas that need to be addressed in order to strengthen our relationship. But we're at the very beginning, and I would say at this point, uh, it's difficult to say exactly what the Russia's, what Russia's intentions are in this relationship. And I think that's the most important part of this meeting, is to have a good exchange between President Trump and President Putin over what they both see as the nature of this relationship between our two countries. So you have, among the things that we think are going to be yeah. addressed, North Korea, you have Ukraine, you have Syria. You have Syria. You have nuclear issues. Na uh, you have you also, yeah, and NATO issues, yeah. On, on Ukraine. Yeah. Um, what clearly Putin wants is a lifting of the sanctions. Uh, the question is, what will the United States um, demand? It's very interesting to have Rex Tillerson there, because as former CEO of Exxon, he also wants sanctions lifted yeah, against I Russia. Mean, it, what's interesting and underreported in this country is that there are several European countries uh, who want sanctions lifted, because they're facing domestic issues at home from farmers, for example, who want exports to go. But, Amy, step back again, if I might. Ukraine. Ukraine could be settled. There was something called the Minsk Accords, Minsk Accords II on the table. You could have an internationally negotiated settlement with U.N. Uh, mandates to secure that. Ukraine becomes a non-aligned country. It becomes part of the EU. It becomes part—I mean, a bridge between East and West. 10,000, more than 10,000 people in Ukraine have died. There needs to be a long-term way to resolve a crisis. Um, it really also is history. You go back. NATO expansion, let's not forget. NATO is a military alliance that was designed to counter the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union ended, there were promises made by George H.W. Bush to Mikhail Gorbachev that NATO would not expand one inch east. Those promises were broken as the U.S. expanded NATO. NATO has become a fateful geographical paradox. It exists to manage the risks it creates. So I think you can't put you, — you can't ignore NATO expansion when you look at Ukraine. But the key thing, for the sake of millions of people, lives, the possibility of a democratic Ukraine is to find a settlement, a negotiation. The sanctions regime, I mean, the vote in the Senate was also about Iranian sanctions. I mean, you have a reformist election in Iran, and they're going to clamp down sanctions to undermine an Iranian nuclear deal, which is, by the way, the pattern, the template for what, what should be done with North Korea, which demands negotiations. And you need China and Russia involved in those negotiations. So I would just say— I mean, the, 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 the vote in the Congress, the vote even, in the if, Congress was even if Trump to wanted two, to lift it. was 98 to 2. 
And I think I, I speak with a lament because, listen, I think cold wars are, are cold wars are bad for the left, are bad for progressives. They empower the military-industrial complex. They empower the worst forces on both sides. They close space for dissent. I am for dissent in both countries. You had a video of Alexei Navalny's arrest prior to this. I worked for the independent leading newspaper in Moscow called Novaya Gazeta, which is under serious threat, where journalists are killed. Journalists. Independent citizens, those uh, philosopher Horvat were talking about, suffer when they're Cold War. So I think we need to think beyond Putin and Trump and find a way to, you know, um, move beyond the forces on the Russia's borders, the possibility of military conflict in Syria. We need deconfliction again. We need to take nuclear weapons off of hair trigger alert. We need to build down our nuclear arsenals. If there were sane, sober people, which is a different discussion. We would have a very different agenda. And then citizens around the world should weigh in and be part of that, and not just Tillerson, Trump, Lavrov and Putin in that tiny little circle. But we're not there yet, because the escalation—and, if I might, a lament, the Democratic Party, they should be working to de-escalate nuclear tensions. They should not be holding out the possibility that anything that comes out of the summit is toxic or a giveaway. And I think that is a real issue. Let me turn to one of those Democratic Congress members speaking on CNN, Democratic Congressman Adam Smith of Washington State, said he wished Trump treated Vladimir Putin more like he treats CNN, which Trump has often called fake news. Putin takes advantage of weakness. And it's very ironic that, for someone with as much bluster as Donald Trump throws around every day, um, certainly, I guess, I, I guess I wish he treated Vladimir Putin more like he treats CNN, um, was more willing to stand up to a world leader who is threatening democracy and undermining countries all across the globe. Because it's not just the U.S. elections that the Russians have hacked into uh, and influenced and manipulated. They've been doing it for quite some time. They, they run disinformation campaigns. So that's Washington State Congressman Adam Smith. Your response to what he has to say? Again, I step back and I look at this gathering, this summit, and it's not about Trump or Putin. It's about each country's interests moving forward. And there is an investigation underway. It must be taken to its final end. Maybe it's obstruction of justice. Maybe it's collusion. But as another Democratic representative, Senator uh, Chris Murphy said just a few weeks ago, it is increasingly the, the, the focus, the obsession almost with Russia and hacking has distracted Democrats from looking more seriously at some of the fundamental issues that are a problem in this country. And I think it's hurting Democrats in that context. I also think, again, to come back to the cyber hacking, instead of the continuing escalation about sowing distrust and undermining our democratic institutions, which, by the way, I believe we are a great, resilient country. We've survived World War I, II. You know, let us focus on a cyber treaty, which the Obama administration didn't participate in. There was one on offer. And I come back, Sam Nunn's letter, which people should read of June 27th, he talks about the need to lay down some cyber rules of the road. And I mean, I hate to get into tit for tat, but there's a very interesting Carnegie Mellon study out just the other week showing the United States has interfered in over 80 foreign elections between 1946 and 2000. That doesn't mean the Russian interference. It is, it is inappropriate. But let us not, you know, um, let us not police the world, either militarily or morally, because we need to get our own house in order, and I think we'd be a better democracy for that. Well, I want to thank you very thank much, you. Katrina Van Hoevel, for joining us, editor and publisher of The Nation, America's oldest weekly magazine. She had been reporting from Moscow for more than three decades. Van Hoevel also is a columnist for The Washington Post.com, and will link uh, to The Nation and to her piece, uh, Patriotism in the Trump Era. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, we go south. We go to La Esperanza, Honduras, where Bertita Zuniga Casades, the daughter of the murdered indigenous environmentalist Berta Casades, had an assassination attempt against her this past weekend. We'll talk to her. Stay with us.